scroll here. Does anybody have any questions before we start? We've got three cameras going on. So that Hunzi can feel like he's sitting right next to Alright, so right, sitting next to right, right there. Alright. Um, any questions? All right, um, so we left off last time. For bottled water. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up that's come up in other natural-ish type disasters. Uh, did we see the, did the prices of water go up in, in Ottawa? Yes. Did the prices go up? You think it did? Yeah. For sure? I saw it. What did you see? How did you oh, see it go well, up? I went, to, I went to Walmart and then I was trying to buy the same brand of water. And it was like, at first it was like two ninety eight, and then I think it went like yesterday and then it was like three ninety eight. Okay. So they did have a little bit of a price. He said it went from two ninety eight to three ninety eight. So maybe if they were having a sale, they decided, eh, maybe it's not a good time to have it on sale. But could they have potentially raised it to seven dollars? Yeah. yeah. But they didn't. How come? So they're nice? Walmart's nice? Wow. No. I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't, haven't heard that. Uh, what's that? Okay, price chopper being across the street. So yeah, there's a little bit of a, you know, that competition factor is huge. And so that would certainly be one thing that would cause people to go across the street. Um, yeah, there, there are, I, there's not a, um, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule of exactly what it would be, but it's called price gouging. And uh, it would take a court case and kind of proving it up. But yeah, if they were to, to raise it to $20 a case, um, more importantly than if they would eventually get, you know, busted for price gouging, which, which is very hard to A, kind of prove and B, get to. There's another negative effect that they would probably feel the impact of right away. And what's that? Losing Just losing customers to goodwill, right? I mean, it, you know, what the raising the prices in, in that case. So some economists would argue that, well, raising the prices um, is, is kind of a natural thing to try to keep those shortages from going on. Because without raising the prices, in some cases, and, you know, in some cases they're just good old fashioned gouging and trying to make a bunch of money. But in other cases, if they don't raise the price, then they'll sell out all the water really quick and they'll be, right? So that pricing mechanism helps uh, some shoppers go to, maybe they have to drive to the next county over to get the more regular price water. You see what I mean? So it kind of helps distribute things around if it's not, uh, if it's not too great crazy. So, so uh, but you know, it doesn't sell too well with the public if they're jacking up prices when there's a disaster. So companies tend not to do that. Uh, in fact, just the opposite. Um, some companies might have a sale or even donate water, right? Just to try to, for reputation purposes. So, um, well, the reason I wanted to bring that up is that on the board, our prediction long term would be that there'd be upward pressure on prices. So again, the insights that the economic model gives us is that in a situation like that, we would expect upward pressure on prices. But that's ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus like what? Ceteris paribus like the company doesn't want a black eye with their customer reputation. So they're not going to actually do as high of a price increase as they, as they would because they're thinking about uh, other factors that influence demand. And so yesterday we had, or not yesterday, two days ago, your picture that you have was a shift to the right of the demand curve from D1 to T2, causing what we predict as an upward 
pressure on prices from P1 to P2 and equilibrium quantity to go up. So this is the picture that you guys had Monday. And so that's our prediction is that there would be an increase in price and an increase in the equilibrium quantity demanded. Again, ceteris paribus, because the only thing we're changing is this crisis of uh, potentially contaminated water that nobody can drink the water in town. So what I want to highlight is that if they do indeed do that, they're not thinking about, if, if a business is being smart, they're not thinking about uh, short-term changes for short-term profit, but what is the demand for their other products? And in the case of Walmart, there's a supply and demand curve. If this is bottled water, of course, Walmart has thousands of other goods, and they're worried about the overall uh, uh, sales of their store. And so if they jack the price up on water because they could do it over this two to three day period, they're gonna decrease the demand for probably bottled water long term because they're a bunch of a-holes, right? We've changed their taste or preferences for Walmart sold water, right? So on your shifter list, the taste or preferences, if we just don't like those people and we think they're evil, that's gonna decrease the demand for bottled water long term, right? So we're still thinking about the demand shifters and their impact on long term profitability with the decision of Walmart likely not to raise water prices too high. Again, maybe they would have had a sale price and they decided, well, we don't really need to hold that sale today, right? And so maybe they, maybe they went from 298 to 398 if they had some sort of special going. So, uh, but they're not going to jump into raising prices too high because of other factors. All right, any questions or comments there? All right, so jumping into the supply shifters today. So the law of supply we did, and the law of supply was if there's an increase in price, what happens to the quantity supplied? Does it go up or down? If there's an increase in price, the quantity supplied goes up, which is sometimes, again, a little counterintuitive because you guys are, are mixing up price and cost. That's not, we're not talking about cost. In fact, we're going to get to cost here, but it's the sale price. So if Walmart is able to um, sell more uh, bottles because of, or if prices go up, in fact, this picture does it perfectly for us, it shows us that effect. The law of supply says if circumstances change where people are willing to pay a higher price so Walmart can get a higher price, they respond to that. They increase the quantity supplied from 100 bottles to 120 bottles, right? So the quantity supplied went from QS1 to QS2. The quantity supplied went up. So this is called a movement along. You'll see this terminology in your textbook and homework problems. A movement along a stationary supply curve is a change, which I usually use a little triangle so you can start to get used to that notation a change in quantity supply. That is the law of supply. So I like to highlight that first because that is not on the supply shifter list. Supply didn't shift because of the price change. Prices are so important that we're choosing to measure them on the vertical axis. That's what I put a dollar sign here today, which we'll kind of generically get into later. But we're measuring price or dollars on the vertical axis. Okay, so what are some things that would cause the supply curve to move around on us? In other words, what would cause it to increase or decrease? What's going to cause the supply relationship to move around 
The law of supply says that if there's an increase in price, that leads to an increase in the quantity supplied, etc. Holding all of the things constant, what are some things that very well could change on this? Technology, good. So one thing might be technology. Now, what do you mean by technology? I agree with you. It's on the list. It's definitely an important one, but that's kind of a black box. What, what is technology? I, Anything that makes it easier to, let's say, you know, gather corn. So okay. Before, before you like track you and like, walk around and do it all yourself, but machine learning you could do pretty much like that whole day's work in a couple of hours. Okay, so it could come in the form of a new invention or a new machine that allows us to gather more corn is what Ike was saying, right? Uh, in, in the case of uh, farm equipment. So it, it's kind of funny. We can we can like describe technology all day long. Well, what's technology? Well, have you ever seen one of these, Dr. McGowan? Uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's technology, right? I can see it. But translating it into what does it do, what is technology, is, is kind of a little different. And so when we talk about the supply of goods and services, we're specifically giving technology a resource hat, in a sense. A resource hat. What were the four basic resources? Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. Technology's not on that list, but the production possibilities frontier. What was the definition of that thing? Look back in your notes. Who's got the production possibilities frontier? I think I defined it for you either last time or maybe it was Friday or maybe it was the time before that. So PPS, what do you got? Good, good. So, shows the maximum combination of two goods an economy can produce given its available resources, land, labor, capital, uh, and entrepreneurship, and technology. So, technology, if we really boil it down to it, is it a machine? No. Is it a person always with some sort of knowledge? No, but we're getting maybe closer, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so it, it's how efficiently you can do it, right? Which might be a combination of machine and person, right? So technology is kind of this elusive thing. At the end of the day, technology is really just information, right? It's kind of like, do it this way and that would be smarter. Oh yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a new technology and it, it influences how productive we can be. So in the production process, uh, a change in technology leads to an increase in our productive capacity, right? Our uh, productivity. So an increase in technology leads to an increase in productivity is how it affects the supply curve. This is kind of the, the production, productivity is the production uh, function. If we think back to our, uh, where's my things? Oh, that's right. I left them there in my other bag because I left them for this class. Uh, the picture that I had before where we're trying to turn the basic resources into pizza, clothing, basketball, beer, chicken wings, right? The production process. Technology helps us make more of that stuff with the same amount of resources, right? And when we start to think about um, a machine replacing a person, did we lose that person? When we think about a machine and a person, did we lose that person? No. So there was a substitution. Let me, let me give you an example of this. Um, Right, let me just put it right underneath this. This is as good as good a spot as any. I'm just going to draw a little production possibilities frontier back to our. Uh, let's go with uh, quantity of beer and quantity of pizza, just to kind of recollect back to what we were doing before. So the production possibilities frontier shows the maximum combination of two goods an economy can produce given its available resources and technology. All of the points along the frontier were what? 
What does he label them? Efficient. What kind of efficient? Which one? No. Oh, the P, though. You were close. Productively efficient or production efficiency. So all of the points along the frontier were equally productively efficient. So what I left you with at one point was which point are we going to be at? That was our point that was allocatively efficient, right? So that was according to preferences, and that's what kind of led us into our demand discussion, uh, which was really the chapter three stuff. So if we have a change in uh, pizza production, there's a new pizza machine. We used to hand roll all of our crusts, and now we've got this machine that can replace what five people used to do with one machine, right? So our typical uh, story of technology. Will that new pizza technology, will that new pizza technology get us any more beer? Probably. Here's the magic of economics. Watch this. If we take this production point, if we take this production point, that's our ceteris paribus point, and I say, hey, there's a new pizza machine or a new pizza technology, right? That will allow us to go from having 100 pizzas to having 150 pizzas, right? That machine helps pizzas. You don't disagree with me there, right? So that's why you're shaking your head the other direction. So now there's a shift of the production possibilities frontier. And that shift looks like this. Did it help beer out? That was kind of your guys' answer. It didn't help beer out at all. I kind of did my little high there, but this endpoint is the same. So if I had 100 beers before as my maximum, I have 100 beers now. So I can now have 150 pizzas. That was your gut feeling. But here's the economics of it that we too often overlook is that along this new frontier, we can be anywhere. We could be here. Is point B better than point A? Yeah. The pizza machine, the pizza technology got us, yes, more pizza, but also got us more beer. In fact, here's an interesting one. How about point C? What's going on with point C? <laughs> Same amount of pizza, more beer, but it was a pizza machine. A pizza machine got us more beer. How? We reallocated, right? Kylie, a little louder? All right, reallocate time and workers, right? So that machine didn't do anything, but if that freed up five people, in the short term, what the media tells you is that that pizza machine caused unemployment. People lost their jobs at the factory. Pizza, people lost something somewhere, right? And I don't deny that. They did. There's a short-term impact. But if now people who were really good at doing dough figure out how to brew some beer, there's new job openings all of a sudden at the beer factory. Maybe as a society we thought, you know what, we, uh, it's nice that we got this pizza machine, uh, but we've about been eating as much pizza as we can. Let's just shift more resources into beer. We can have the same amount of pizza we were having before, and look at all the beer that we got. That's pretty awesome. That's why technology and change is so important in the economy, it turns out not to matter what good had the technological advance for economic growth. We can all have more of everything, potentially anyway. Remember, we're talking about production possibilities, production potential. Ultimately, after the dust settles, no matter what change in technology there was, it causes more of everything through this reallocation of resources. Pretty powerful. Questions or comments there? All right, so um, from, the, from the supply standpoint, 
of a specific good, if we're back into bottled water, if there's an increase in technology, that allows us to crank out more, more bottles of water for the same amount of resources. Which means that I can do them usually in a less, least costly way. It's a little bit cheaper, right? So the technology causes an increase in productivity. Productivity is a word that I know is a little abstract for, uh, for most people here jumping into it. So productivity is really the number of units of output of bottled water, of what we're making, divided by the number of units of inputs. Whether that be labor, whether that be machines, we can measure productivity. And so the idea here is that I, a new technology makes a person more productive, for instance. I used to only be able to, uh, what was our machine, what was the example you gave? I guess it was on pizza boat. Before that, what's some other technology? Huh? Corn, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I used to, I used to, one single farmer on average per farmer, used to do 100 bushels, now with the new machine, they can do 500 bushels, right? So 500 bushels of corn, number of units of output, per one farmer, per one unit of labor, right? Goes from 100 bushels to 500 bushels. That's pretty cool. That gives us the ability to be a little more profitable with it. And so that's going to tend to increase supply. So an increase in technology at the end of the day leads to an increase in supply, which is a shift to the right. A shift to the right. Now let me show you why I'm kind of getting hung up on the right and left stuff. A shift to the right means an increase in supply is going to head this direction, right? Is that down or up? That would be down if we're in the up-down language, right? So a shift to the right. Now, when I did the water bottle thing, this was an increase in demand, which was a shift to the right, which would be kind of in an up-down world, up or down. Uh, so in this case, an increase in demand was kind of an up, but an increase in supply was kind of a down. See how that screws you up? The up and the down are flip flops But if you're left and right, not only does it make more economic sense because again, we're thinking about the price change at each price, what are we doing? But it also keeps you straight in terms of left and right. An increase is always a shift to the right no matter if you're talking about supply or demand, and a shift to the left is always a decrease. Okay, so that's the whole left and right business. All right, good, so technology, that was a good one. Um, what else we got that influences the supply of pizza in Ottawa? Or the supply of bottled water if you want, but I kind of like thinking about the pizza village or, or pizza time on Main Street. What else causes a change in the supply or the supply of pizza in Ottawa? In the, if we think about the market being the city of Ottawa. Competition, good. So if there's more stores that open up, that's going to increase the supply of pizza, not for any one particular company necessarily, but for the market there would be. So one of our other shifters is the number of suppliers, the number of companies, the number of firms, the amount of competition, if you will, if there's an increase in the number of firms, that's going to be an increase in the supply curve, a shift to the right. So more companies enter, there's more companies producing. Holding all of the things constantly. All right, running our pizza place, thinking about the market for pizza or possibly an individual pizza shop. What else would change the supply of pizza? The amount of resources. Okay, so um, if you're running the small pizza shop, um, it's not so much the amount of resources per se, typically, 
But what about the resources? Yeah, so kind of the, if they're scarce, the price would go up. So it's the price of resources that drives that individual decision, right? So that's number three. This is probably one of the most important ones. The price of resources. The price of resources is really the cost of doing business, right? This is the cost of doing business. So for example, if there's an increase in, uh, especially if we're doing um, um, a pizza place, if there's an increase in, in uh, wages, probably the minimum wage, would be one that's kind of a hot button here lately. If there's an increase in wages, what happens to the supply of pizza? Goes down. So left or right? Left, which kind of looks up. So always got to be careful with the down, up, down stuff, right? So a decrease in the supply. So an increase in wages causes a decrease in the supply of pizza, for instance. So if minimum wage goes up, companies are going to find it uh, more difficult to um, supply pizza to the market. What happens incidentally then to the price of pizza when wages go up? Prices go up, right? So if we're in this market again, just for illustration, if that thing's moving up, the price of pizza is going to go up, which makes sense. The, those costs have to be covered somehow, so it's going to put upward pressure on, on pizza. One of the things that hardly ever gets talked about in the media with the minimum wage business, which I don't agree with one bit, by the way, for multiple reasons that I'll share with a few with you now, is that if the minimum wage goes to, I don't know, $15 an hour, and you're a pizza place that's normally been paying your employees seven fifty, eight, nine, ten, I don't know, pick a number. Nobody's paying fifteen for most of the hired help here in Ottawa. What is the business going to do long term in terms of the pizza production process? Increased prices, they're gonna to have to do that to some degree somehow. So that's gonna be long. Decrease the amount of employees it takes, right? So they they have to cut back, and then what else might they seek out? So they they have to be able to make the crust somehow. It normally took five guys. They were employing five people at eight dollars an hour to make the crust. Kind of getting back to my crust example. Minimum wage goes up. That has a large impact on the bottom line. All of a sudden, what becomes kind of cheap? That machine, right? So how many of you have seen a change at, take a place like McDonald's, on their production process? Do they use a lot of machines in their production process? Do some of the fast food places have people in India that are actually taking your order at the drive through window? Do you guys know that? Uh, Wendy's uh, experimented with that. As far as I know, they're still doing it. But when you say, hello, can I take your order? That person's in India. They're not sitting in behind the booth over there. They figured out that to take an order, they can, they can do that. In fact, they find that their labor that's specially trained in taking that order that live in India, who are putting in a longer shift and taking on uh, more calls from possibly uh, multiple restaurants, when, when it's lunchtime in, uh, when it's lunchtime in, New York, it's not lunchtime here, but then the Wendy's, when it becomes lunchtime and they get heavier traffic, they can take orders in, in the Midwest, right? So by having that person specialized, they're really always on the spot with, well, would you like to supersize that? Would you like a shake? We have these new tasty shakes that are new on the menu today only. They do that better than our American counterparts who have a labor turnover problem of teaching the high school kid what to say at the microphone, right? The long training process. These people are specialized sales specialists that can upsell. So they see an uptick in their, uptick in their sales uh, through the drive-through window. 
by being able to shift resources differently. So all of that upward pressure on minimum wages tends to uh, take away jobs here. Uh, many people are too far short-sighted, not thinking about the long-term implications of substituting machines for people, uh, less customer service, you know, the whole, the whole list goes on. Uh, Seattle passed the $15 minimum wage, and youth unemployment, age 15 to 25, is 33%. So now we've got a culture where high school kids can't develop a work ethic early on because they can't find a job. Okay? So uh, to me, the, the impacts of that um, are always uh, tend to be brushed under the table because people look at, oh, yeah, everybody deserves a $15 wage. That sounds like a good idea, except for the people who aren't working. And unfortunately, you can't go interview those people very easily because they don't know that they're going to lose a job when it changes to $15, right? It's only after the fact that we start to be able to interview uh, maybe some of those folks and, and struggles that they're going through uh, for not having a job. Okay, questions or comments, Sarah? So this, of course, uh, you know, works for um, um, machines as well. So if there's an increase in the price of uh, computers or machines, so it's price of resources in general. All right. Um, let's see. Next one that's a little difficult. Price of related outputs. Price of related outputs. Price of related outputs. Okay, so um, with this one, if we're a if we're a farmer who tends to rotate or has the ability to go uh, soybeans or corn uh, on their on their farm ground, right? They, they usually practice good crop rotation and they kind of go through beans and corn in different in different fractions to to try to do. Uh, they they got the long term thing with soil preservation. So, but if there's an increase in the price of soybeans, if there's an increase in the price of soybeans, what happens to the supply of corn market-wide, do you think? If there's a pretty dramatic increase in the price of soybeans, what do you think is going to be the impact in the corn market? It's going to go down because they're going to chase the soybeans, right? Soybean prices are good. Let's put soybeans in this year. Not everybody. Maybe they're doing crop rotation, but there'll be uh, an incentive there to plant beans this year or more beans than maybe we would normally. And so that's going to lead to a decrease in the supply of corn. These two outputs are... What was the words we learned last time? This is kind of similar to the one we did for demand curves. What are these two outputs for the farmer? We got substitutes or complements was the two words. Are these substitutes or complements? Substitutes, right? The farmer can do one or the other on a given plot of land. They're going to have to make their choice. So these two things are substitutes in the production process. Okay, so that's one thing, A. What about uh, another case? Um, if there's, uh, anybody got, um, is anybody a, a B? A uh, bee, I don't know what you call them, a bee farmer or what you call them, but a bee person. Your family beekeeper, thank you. I knew there was a word. Uh, any beekeepers, family back at home, anybody keeping bees? Usually I find more people with bee allergies or bee sting allergies than I do people keeping bees. Uh, but that's been, that's been fairly popular. So, um, you know, you can, you can make your own honey. And if you do it, what else do you do once you get the honey out? What's left behind? The honeycomb, what's it made of? 
wax, right? So that's beeswax. And so sometimes you can make candles out of beeswax, and you can do some other things. Uh, Burt's beeswax, you guys ever use that lip balm? Maybe you've seen it at the checkout register, right? Burt's beeswax. So he kind of came up with that use of beeswax. So um, if there's an increase in the price of honey, if honey prices are high, what happens to the supply of beeswax? It goes, I heard it up and it down. Which one is it? I heard a couple people. So if there's honey, what happens to the supply of beeswax? It goes up, right? So people are going to start doing more bees to make more honey, but as a result of making the honey, we get the byproduct left behind of beeswax. So there's an increase in the supply of beeswax. So these two things are complements in production. Complements in production. All right, questions or comments on price of related outputs? Okay, number five, expectations. Expectations. So expectations are kind of all across the board kind of depends on the situation is the first comment I would make. The impact of expectations is going to depend on the situation. So if there's an increase in the expected price of corn, if corn is expected to go up, Maybe there's a new technology coming around where we're figuring out how to um, drive cars on corn or something, turn it into some sort of fuel. If there's an increase in the expected price of corn, what happens to the supply of corn? What happens to the supply of corn? It's going to go up, right? If, if the future price is higher, then... For one thing, with corn, we might have a planting or growing season, but people are going to want to shift into uh, corn. Now, notice if there's an increase in the price of corn, if this is our corn market, the actual today's price, there's not a shift, but rather there's this movement along the stationary supply. The increase in the quantity supplied is the impact that's going on today. But future expected prices are going to start to change behavior even more and cause an increase in supply. And by the way, when people do this, what happens to the prices today? So if there if corn the corn market's expected to be hot down the road, What's going to happen to today's corn prices? Go down, right? So now, some of you, I can tell, are starting to still kind of want to use your gut feeling. I want you to start to get comfortable with the model. The first thing in becoming comfortable is knowing that increase, increase, this means a shift to the right. As this thing starts to shift to the right, prices start to fall, right? So that's going to have an impact today on if people start thinking that the future prices are going to uh, change. All right, and then we can talk about expected weather, um, you know, all, all kinds of things on expectations. So that's just going to depend on the, on the circumstances. Um, one of the, the last things I might add that sometimes could be lumped into – uh, lumped into a different category is kind of the state of nature. The state of nature. So the classic thing would be the weather. Uh, 
um, if there's a natural disaster or something, right, and it wipes out the crop. Now, I did the bottled water exercise. That led to people looking for more. But in the case of uh, maybe some crops freezing, that would take, uh, lead to a decrease in the supply, right? So if we actually are wiping out something through natural disaster, so weather, uh, natural disaster, that destroys the supply. There was a decrease in financial services when the trade towers fell in 2001, right? We wiped out, a lot of people got killed that were specialists in financial services. Instantly, Wall Street was changed, especially for the next two to three months, right? But even long-term, the amount of people that got uh, killed in, in that event changed the supply of financial services since Wall Street is such a, uh, a hotbed of financial services. Okay, so that's all the supply stuff. So now we've got uh, both of them on the table. I recommend that you memorize the list of supply shifters. And so come up with your, with your Way to memorize them. Let's see what story I could possibly tell today. Ah, let's see, that's an N, I guess, huh? Ah, to not predicts evil. What? <laughs> Help me. Stools! Thank you. It's so easy. I just couldn't do it. So you guys come up with your own memorization, but if you want to run with this one, to not, this was number, to not poop predicts evil stools. Yeah, whatever works for you. You guys come up with your own thing, but have that, have those lists memorized. Have those lists memorized. Don't ask me why poop always enters into my, uh, my mnemonic devices here, but uh, it just does. All right, so let's recap the demand shifters real quick. So number one, taste of preferences. And we can take them out of order. I don't care. It really doesn't matter what the order is, but you might want to preserve your own. Income, good. And there was normal goods and inferior goods, but I just kind of want the quick list right now. Price of related goods. Population. Population and expectations. Now, the reason why I wanted to kind of put these up here is, is look at how close some of these are. Um, some of them are very similar. So we got the price of related goods is kind of like the price of related outputs. Expectations, of course, were like the expectations. Uh, population, number of suppliers. Right, so there's kind of some connectivity on the on similarities, so it's not, not too hard of a list. Um, so that is your that is your um, your charge to have that memorized, because that's going to help you answer the problem. But let's come up with a problem for you to work on. So let's see. I think. Uh, I think I'll just build off of our bottle of water thing here. Um, uh, no, no, let's go a different direction. Um, give me, give me some sort of food product. Pizza. Oh, we can use pizza. I, I love pizza, but oh, let's go with something other than pizza. Oh, I want to come up with something fresh or something new. Burritos. All right, I can do. We can do burritos. Okay. 
Uh, uh, how do you like your burritos? Are you bean, chicken, steak? What, what's your deal? <laughs> steak? All right. <laughs> so, example. Suppose the FDA determines that um, steak causes cancer. There's new research out. Um, what is the impact of this finding in the market for steak burritos? Use supply and demand and show the changes in equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. Suppose the FDA determines that steak causes cancer. What is the impact of this finding in the market for steak burritos? Use supply and demand and show the changes in equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. So you can work with your neighbor if you want. I'm going to come around. I want you to. I want you to get this. Get this going here. I'll give you a couple minutes to work on it. You people online, I'll check. We got Jackie and Hunzi, so make sure you're writing on your papers. I'll come check with you two as well. In fact, uh, this might be kind of fun, Jackie and Hunzi. You guys can share your screen if you want, but then you'd have to have a camera on it. Never mind. You're better off just holding up the paper. But there is a share screen function. But so go. <laughs> This is equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. P star and Q star. All right, what's going on? Oh, you're done already? Okay. All right. Maybe explain explain in words a little bit what's going on. It looks pretty good. Okay, you're a little a little sloppy here, so I want to make sure you've got labels there. So this is yours. So start with home base. That's always your starting place. If you're stuck, go to home base. That's your first starting place. We'll try to call out of time, yeah? Just do the old good there. Uh, your label's wrong now, right? I think that's a little bit of dollar sign or a price. I don't think I'm going to do that. Go to home base. Go to home base. Go to home base. That's your starting place. You'll at least get partial credit on the test if you don't have a home base. So that one is the way all of these problems really start off. So, gentlemen. So we're starting on this problem. What's written in green is what we're working on. You might want to just start by writing that out. So there, there's the result. Okay. Jackie, what do you have so far? Can I see your paper? Hunzi, why don't you hold your papers up? Okay. No. Okay, so Jackie gets. Up, put down the basics of the, the demand and the supply curve, okay? So add that, but I'm glad you got that part going. Hunzi, let me see yours. Hunzi, let me see yours. Okay, okay. Show it a little bit closer. I want to see if you got that right on it. I can't quite see. Oh, okay, you need to label your curves yet, but starting to look good. All right. All right, so I tried to get all of these problems, even if you are freaking clueless here, you will get partial credit on some test questions for knowing what home base is. 
demand downward sloping, supply upward sloping. There's some sort of starting quantity and some sort of whoops, price. That is home base. Now, to add one more layer of dimension, this is completely generic, right? So what else would I want to add to home base? And some of you forgot to, you got a little sloppy and didn't put your P's and your Q's here, so always label your axes, get your labels on your initial demand and supply curve, and then also, very important, don't put stuff out into this space. Remember, we talked about that with the halves and the fifths, that this is where quantities live, this is where prices live. And so you always have to be tying this stuff back to the axes. So that's our home base. What market is this? We need to label this market. What is it? The burrito market. Yeah, the steak burrito. It's not the steak market. It's not uh, the cancer market or something. I don't know what it is. but So make sure you say that this is the steak burrito market. And we might just put the quantity of SBs, right? Steak burritos. We can kind of be a little shorthanded. But now we've got our market that we're analyzing identified. Okay. So what, uh, what's going on here then? Demand shifts down to the left. Why? Taste your preferences. And because people don't watch it, but I, I'm glad uh, uh, Kylie brought up, be specific to your shifter list. So mentally, I kind of want you guys going back to what shifter is it, what shifter it is. Because that's where you want to kind of go back to is like, okay, it's cancer, I get it, Russ, there's, nobody wants burritos anymore, right? But I don't want you to do that. I want you to kind of think a little more formally about this because some of them won't be maybe as obvious as this one is on the direction of change. So think that consumers are uh, changing their taste or preferences for burritos. Some people, of course, aren't going to believe the research. The FDA is full of crap, and I, don't think, I think there's a couple other researchers that say they're not. So the market might not disappear, but we should predict that prices are going to go down. Quantity, equilibrium quantity is going to go down. So this kind of shows this. If you want to sometimes add arrows to the left, but what I really like to see is the D1 and D2 so that I know that it went from this level to this level. So kind of get into this type of notation, D1, D2. Notice that the ones and the twos kind of uh, work with each other. Okay, is that it? Are we done? What else is going on here? With the supply, okay, why, and why is that? Okay, so you want the supply curve to shift to the left? How many people are thinking we need supply to shift to the left? Yeah, I see quite a few hands up in support. What do you think? Expectations of demand going down would lead to what? Uh, so you're supporting the supply thing going to the left? Okay, why do you say that? Because I think they're not, like the production companies are taking on the steak burrito, they're not going to make more, but they're not necessarily going to make less if they have them in the high price out of the So, and another way to maybe think about what you're doing is are they making less because what went on with the cancer? Have they reacted to the cancer shock? <laughs> Right up here on the graph, not weaving any more stories, yeah. has the suppliers, have they changed their behavior based on the cancer deal? No. <laughs> what have they done differently? They've dropped, not the price, they didn't, they didn't necessarily drop the price, the price dropped on them in a sense. They had to react the market. So they supplied less. The quantity supplied went down, right? Because 
that behavior is already captured by the law of supply. Cancer causes a decrease in demand. A decrease in demand causes a drop in price. Taco Bell and the others react to that by supplying less. It's, it's going on right here, right? So the supply went down from 80 burritos per day to 55 burritos per day or whatever, right? So they are indeed supplying less. Remember, what makes equilibrium, what makes this little star thing? When we talked about equilibrium last time or maybe the time before. Yeah. That was the quantity and supply meet the quantity. Yes, quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. So the quantity demanded fell at this price because here we had, uh, let's just simply call this no cancer, cancer demand curve, right? So at this price, uh, let me put a little more meat on the bones here. Uh, what's our burrito running? $4 in normal pricing? $4 burrito? Maybe it's a little bit, that's kind of, kind of cheap or at Chipotle or something, but. Uh, so we got a $4 burrito, and now it's fallen down to, uh, looks like $2.20, right? So we had a decrease in price because at $2.20, without cancer, people would want to buy this many, right? That quantity demanded still exists, if you will. So all of these are just collections of points, and at the equilibrium price, something special was going on. The quantity supplied equaled the quantity demanded. I go over to the supply curve, which is just where it was before, drop down. I go over to the new demand curve with cancer, drop down. They both equal 55. So the supply curve does not move. That behavior is already captured by the decrease in price. They reacted. There's just not any shift. So my recommendation to students is to don't get shift happy. That will usually save you. So the key point here, the key point to these problems, don't get what I call shift happy. Oh, something happened, so we gotta we gotta be shifting something, and then this would have happened, and this is where the shift. And I've seen students like do four shifts on this. Like, well, this price went down, and so that means they weren't as much, so supply must have went down, but now it's gone up, so demand must have changed, right? And they kind of you try to walk through all of that. Um, for these problems, there's typically going to be a, a a shock. So in this case, it was a demand shock, and that's going to impact one of the curves, it's going to move and then just interpret it. It's usually just kind of a one and done thing. Don't get shift happy. Usually, I'm going to put this caveat on so I can't get sued, but usually, like most of the time, one event, quote unquote, or shock, one ceteris paribus change, right? One event, like this cancer thing coming out, one event leads to one of the curves, supply or demand, shifting. Okay. Um, where would it where would it affect more than one? What's that? <coughs> uh that's what I mean. I can't think of any. So it's pretty much uh there there might be something with uh a, a couple of them like expectations could possibly impact both sometimes, but for your guys' purposes for the homework problems you're gonna do, it's a one and a uh, it's going to be pretty much one event causes one thing to shift. And that's why you got to know your shifter list really well so that you know it's just the supply curve or it's just the demand curve and then interpret it and you're, and you're good. Okay, so here I will give you an example when both curves shift though. It's going to be something like this. So example number one. 
This is example number two. Continued from example number one. Meaning, suppose the FDA determines that state causes cancer and, so we're going to go dot, 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 and, um, minimum wage increases from seven twenty five to fifteen dollars. What is the effect? Blah 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 blah. So suppose we have now two events, and that's what it'll be like when you read these. It'll be like, well, that has nothing to do with this, or it does. Then you'll start to play games with yourself. But usually, it'll be kind of two separate events, two separate shocks. All right, so let me give you a couple more minutes. Tell me again. Remember, you still have to run through all the, the process. You might want to start with a fresh graph is what I'd recommend. Go to home base again and do these two. So for example number two, create a new graph and then make sure you make your prediction on equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. And you can work with your neighbors or whatnot. Yeah. So what are like the home base and now be where we ended up on the first one? Or we... No, home base is a fresh start with two things happening. Yeah. Yep. So good, good question. We're not starting here, but we're having both events happen at the same time. State causes cancer, minimum wage legislation is passed. Okay, I'll come around and see how you're doing. If you're done, just kind of shove your paper over me and I'll take a peek at it. Okay, don't okay. so that, that demand is so we want to. one event, one event, Okay, it's like possibility, but it's not quite right. So one thing I want to make sure you yep. get your yeah. 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 So at the end of the day, you need to answer what's going to happen to equilibrium price. So So how come we got demand 
demand shift to the left, just like we had before. Most of you, not all of you, but most of you had the right thing going with minimum wage. So some of you brought up the an increase in income. And so if there was an increase in income, what would happen to demand? That's one of our demand shifters. It would go up, it would shift to the right. Now, is that appropriate for this problem? Why? Not everybody's getting the minimum wage bump, right? So who is getting impacted by the minimum wage? Taco Bell, Chipotle, all the suppliers that have minimum wage type workers. So this is more of the price of resources that wages are going up, right? So that's going to shift the supply curve to the left. All right, I saw a lot of answers like this which is a good beginner stab at this. And so then sometimes you are sloppy with P2 equals P1 and we get back to the same price. Some of you did this, but not everybody. And then equilibrium quantity went down. So some of you had some things dangling off into space. So remember that the the new equilibrium is where the new demand curve, new supply curve is, and then you can kind of influence it, impact it. But I did not see one right answer out there. So if you can help me on this, I'd love to give an extra credit point to somebody who can fully address the correct answer. The, the two shocks happen. Use supply and demand show the changes to equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. The, the really fully correct answer I did not see on anybody's paper. I didn't look at everybody, so if you think you got the right answer, raise your hand, I'll come out and look at it. I'll have you come up. Ty, come on up. Anybody else? Bring your paper up. Um, so price went down. Quantity went a little bit down. A little Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, so the, the supply curve is actually shifting to the left. So that is the correct answer. That, that part, so that wasn't it. 
How many people had a decrease in price? Raise your hand, because I saw some of those. There's decreases in prices. How many people had the price stayed the same? Another handful of five names. How many people had price going up? Boy, about the same amount of hands. Interesting. We had about the same amount distributed. So which one's right? Who got the answer right? The ups, the evens, or the downs? Turns out nobody got it right. Why? So let me review that again. Y'all are wrong, but equally distributed. Some people said, Russ, there'll be a decrease in price. Some people said there'll be the price will stay the same. Some people said the price will go up. All of you are equally wrong. What is your correct your most correct answer about your prediction with equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity? All of you, by the way, are kinda right. But kind of right is wrong in this case, the way the question's set up. There's not enough Excellent. All right. Uh, I'm giving your name again. Emma. Emma. So what do you mean by that? There's not enough information to determine the price is what I heard Emma say. I mean, as far as looking at how we don't necessarily have any numbers to base on and what drives that result of whether you got an increase in price or decrease in price? What are the what's the driving factors there? We draw our lines. Where you draw your lines, right? So in some respects, you guys were kind of right the way you drew the line. But with this particular problem, we don't have enough data. There's not enough information to say how big the shift was. And in fact, it could have been here which causes an increase in price. Or it could have been here, which causes a decrease in price. Or the supply curve could have been here, which causes a decrease in price. Or the supply curve could have been here, or 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 here. Now, as we look at that little waffle that I created, what can you tell me about the waffle? Equilibrium could be at any of those points. Now, what about quantity? Quantity goes down for sure. So with quantity, we're for sure, if we kind of put a big star here, check it out. All of the possible equilibrium points all lie to the left of where we started. So the best answer for this problem is that we know for sure that quantity is going to go down, but we're unsure about price. It could go up, it could go down, it could stay the same, there's not enough information. All right, questions on that? I'll write that out here so that we have the, uh, the correct way you'll see this. All right, um, so a couple notes. There was two distinct shocks, which typically means there's going to be two shifts. And so um, there'll be a, well, I'll, I'll try to be a little more formal with this. So the cancer leads to a decrease in demand and the minimum wage uh, hike leads to an increase, oops, I mean a decrease, a decrease in supply. Equilibrium price or equilibrium quantity will decrease, but we will be uncertain about the change in price in equilibrium price. 
So cancer leads to a decrease in demand, and the minimum wage hike leads to a decrease in supply. Equilibrium quantity will decrease for sure, but we will be unsure about the change in price. So let me give you the key point that kind of generalizes that, that you'll certainly see come up. So the key point. Whenever both curves shift, whenever, whenever both curves shift, you will be sure you will be sure about one variable, price or quantity, and unsure about the other. That's always going to turn out to be that way. So example number three, let's just give you the shifts. Suppose there's an increase in demand and a decrease in supply. Again, a, a, one of the questions from your homework or test is going to be kind of a story with a shock. But let me just give you the increase in demand, decrease in supply. Go to home base, and you might want to try my waffle. My waffle. It's kind of fun. So I. I and I like the waffle thing. The waffle thing might not be good for you to do on a test, but it might be a good thing to do in your side notes to kind of help you answer the question. So we've got an increase in demand and a decrease in supply. Two curves are shifting for whatever reasons. Shifters. So first person with the right answer, extra credit point. Nope. Yep. Oh, geez, I was expecting somebody to just be chomping at the bit. So raise your hand. I'll try to look online, too, if you get the answer. Extra credit. Raise your answer. You can say got it or something if you want. Looking, looking. Be brave. If you think you got it, put it up. You got nothing to lose but being wrong. Who the hell cares about that? All right, there we go. There's one. Okay, what's your name? Matt. Maddie. Maddie. What do you say? What's your answer? Yep. Uh, just no. I just want your. Uh, what happens to equilibrium price? What happens to equilibrium quantity? I'm just going to write it on the board as you say it. So. Okay, one goes up and one you're unsure about, or one goes down or one goes. I, one. Okay, so which one? Okay, but uh, give me the result in terms. So let me go back to here just to show what happened. We were predicting what happens to price, and we said quantity goes down. So all I want is what happens to P star, and what happens to Q star. Is there an up arrow, down arrow, up arrow, down arrow, or a question mark? Question. Hold on, let Maddie go. This is she got extra credit on the line. What are your answers? Okay, quantity up and price. Up. Okay, now, how do we know that Maddie's not correct in this case? Because one we know about, and one we don't. Now let me see your waffle, Maddie. I think since you were the brave, you were so timid about it. I don't care that you're wrong. You're still making that waffle. Okay, so demand is going up, right and supply hey. is going okay. this way. Okay, so what I'd like to see with your waffle is I don't know what about. all of this. Now look at look at where we started and look at all the boxes. I'm just on here now. Okay. All right. So, uh, what's going on here then? Let me go to the 
back, way back, uh, let me go, to James, is it? Yeah, Dylan put his hand up before. Dylan put his hand up before? Okay, Dylan, what do you got? Um, he started it was up. Up? And you don't have a... And question mark. Okay? So let's check it out. Increase in demand? Don't do one when you can have more fun with more, right? So of the possibilities, demand could go here, 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 here. Supply curve is going down, which is a shift to the left. Don't do one when you can have more fun. And we started here. That means we've got, I didn't even finish out my home base today. Q1 and P1. Prices for sure going up. All the possible equilibrium points are above where we started, but we're unsure about the quantity. So that's how you use that little tool if there's, if there's multiple things shifting. So any last questions about that? All right, here. Maddie, what's your last name? With an N? All right. Okay, so um, that's our shifter business. So um, I'm going to actually jump into chapter five today. It's a short chapter, but I think it's better placed on what we've done so far before we get into chapter four. So this was all chapter three, what I just concluded with the supply shifters and, and all of that and a couple of examples on it. So chapter five is part of this mod stuff. And I just want to spend a little bit of time. We'll, we'll certainly, yeah, we'll probably knock it all out here. So chapter five uh, looks at the value of the market. The value of the market system for uh, people engaged in trade. So we call this welfare economics which I'm sure most of you are thinking food stamps and that sort of thing, but we're actually not talking about that kind of welfare. So welfare in the sense of, of kind of happiness or well-being. So I would substitute the word well-being if you want. Could kind of get into happiness or something. But it's really a valuation. This, this definition is a little bit better. Thinking about the value of the market system, uh, uh, the people that are are engaged in trade. And so the first value that I want to look at is called consumer surplus. Consumer surplus. CS. Consumer surplus. We've actually talked about consumer surplus already, and that's why I kind of wanted to fit it in here with what we've done today. So consumer surplus is the difference the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay and what they Actually, pay probably better grammar with he or she there. Uh, what they actually pay, what they actually pay for each unit consumed. The difference between what a consumer is willing to pay and what they actually pay for each unit consumed. Consumer surplus. How many of you have bought something and felt like you got a deal on it? Raise your hand. 
like to see all the hands in the air. I, I hope that you've done that, right? So hopefully, if you're a deal, if you're a deal shopper, you do this frequently. Well, that deal is consumer surplus. The deal that you got is consumer surplus because the reason you feel like you got a deal is because you were willing to pay more than you actually did, right? You might have thought you got a good bargain and you paid a price and maybe you thought you could have beat them up a little bit more than you did, but you still ultimately paid less for the good than what you were willing to pay for the good. You don't let them know that, but you got consumer surplus, right? So on our graphs that we've been spending so much time on here, if we take home base, so go ahead and draw home base. And then um, let's bring a new into the discussion here. So something that we haven't talked about. Give me a good, any good, any good, any good. Now. Ice cream we haven't had. We had shoes before. Ice cream. All right. So we're looking at the ice cream market here. And are you talking an ice cream cone or a half gallon or a gallon of ice cream? Who said ice cream? I didn't even say it. Okay. And you want the gallon. All right. So we got uh, quantities in per gallon form here. Uh, I haven't bought a gallon of ice cream in a long time. What's a gallon running to you? Depending on what you get, it, it ranges from like three to five. Three to five, call it four for fun here. All right, so let's say $4. Yeah. So we got an equilibrium price of $4, and again, just for argument's sake, we'll put 100 for the quantity, right? So in the market currently, we're selling 100 gallons of ice cream at a price of $4. Um, so what's your favorite? Chocolate, just straight, just straight chocolate. All right, so chocolate ice cream. You guys can put your own favorite ice cream down here. Chocolate, chocolate. All right. So, um, Tia, what's the? This is this is gonna be kind of hard, but what what do you think is? What the value if it, if it was priced at four, and you're obviously an ice cream lover. <laughs> Of some sort, right? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. You know, if you walked in the store, it almost doesn't matter what price it was, within reason. I mean, how much more would you pay if you walked in and you're kind of, you got a hankering for chocolate ice cream? I mean, would you pay would you pay six dollars? If it just said six, would you not really think much about the price because you just want it? Or seven dollars, eight dollars, four dollars? I mean I don't know. I don't wanna pay like that much extra. Okay. Just Fair enough. I don't like but when you're but when you're in the mood for a chocolate ice cream, what price would cause you to walk out of the store without it? That's kind of a different way to look at it. So you really now you got to remember. I'm trying to put you in a mindset here. If you you want chocolate ice cream, right? You, you went to the store basically specifically for chocolate ice cream. You walk in, you say, "Oh crap, I'm not paying that," and you walk out. What's that number? I mean, it's up, it's up to you. I was thinking about it, and so I'll say Okay, that's fine. I mean, so that's the way some of that consumer, you know, if, it, if it's eight bucks, she's like, and maybe you think to yourself, I know Price Chopper's got it cheaper, right? And so if it's, but let's say Price Chopper's closed, Walmart's open 24 hours, having this, this chocolate ice cream spent at 1 a.m. in the morning, right? Now all of a sudden, the number of substitutes at your disposal has gone down. You might even go breaking the eight dollar ceiling. So the point with all that is that somewhere on here, people are willing to pay more. Some people are willing to pay more than that, right? So we're all across the board. But when Tia goes in and buys the, my scale's not very good here. Maybe I should do Tia. Well, wow, that's almost it. I kind of blew the scale, but. Somebody out here, maybe I'll just talk in generalities. What is the six dollars here? The uh, forty-sixth 
gallon of ice cream. If we ordered the consumers in terms of their most willing to pay, the really chocolate lovers to the, you know, on down, then we have this declining willingness to pay. So the person who bought the 46 gallon was willing to pay $6. They actually paid the market price of $4. And so they got graphically this vertical distance here of the 46th gallon. They got $2 worth of consumer surplus, right? Okay? For that one person, that one gallon. Now this gallon here, the, the 90th gallon, somebody out there was willing to pay $4.75 but they only paid four. So they got 75 cents worth of a deal, if you will, right? And the super chocolate lovers down here, they were really willing to pay the premium and buy it for $8.33. So they got $4.33 worth it. Again, my scaling is really bad here. But if we do that for all of the units, we start to fill in this triangle. That is consumer surplus. It's the market value of the ice cream. All of the consumers with various tastes and preferences, their willingness to pay, that is the consumer's benefit to having ice cream available at a price of $4. We're recognizing that uh, valuation is subjective and depends on the person. Okay, questions or comments on that? What is the consumer surplus of the hundredth gallon of ice cream? This is one that will hang you up on your homework problems. What is it? Zero. Zero. Does that mean that person got screwed? No. No. They were willing to pay $4. They actually paid $4. So they didn't get screwed what they were willing to it happens to be what they actually got paid, right? So just because there's no consumer surplus doesn't mean that they got screwed. So don't be afraid of this last unit, but that is the way we're interpreting this is that we've got our, our marginal goggles on where we have the second and the 46th and the 90th and the 100th, right, of uh, analyzing each one of these. Okay. Producers have surplus also. So, producer surplus. Producer surplus is the difference. The difference between what a seller or producer producer slash seller actually gets and the minimum, the minimum amount he or she or it, in the case of a corporation, he or she or it, maybe I'll throw that it on there, he or she or it must get for each unit sold. The difference between what the producer or seller actually gets and the minimum amount he or she must get for each unit sold. So, what is the price that the seller actually gets in our ice cream market over here? What is the price that the seller actually gets? Four dollars. Good. The equilibrium price. Ice cream's just selling for four dollars. They have a price of four dollars and they see how much they sold. So the amount that they actually get is P star the equilibrium price in this example that we're doing. Now, if we go back and analyze gallon by gallon, 
the 46 gallon, the minimum amount they needed to get was somewhere down here at, uh, I almost put that in the middle, it looks like $2 maybe. And so the cost of the 46 gallon, because that's what this was, the last unit produced, the cost of that unit was $2. And so the difference between four and two is two. So in chapter two, we had some other labels to this instead of S and D. What were the labels in chapter two? Marginal cost and marginal benefit. Good, marginal cost and marginal benefit. The supply curve turns out to be the marginal cost curve, the cost of each additional unit. And the demand curve is really the marginal benefit curve, the benefit from each additional unit. Now, it's not perfectly, what, what makes it a marginal benefit versus a demand curve is the dollars. So when we're thinking about marginal benefit, it's kind of like, the, well, I just get a certain amount of happiness. Well, how many units? 100 units of happiness. Okay, fine. That's your marginal benefit. The benefit measured in some sort of units that you made up. Fine. I can live with that. In fact, we're going to do that in later chapters. But when we express it in terms of dollars, what's, this, what's the benefit of this unit worth to you? Ah, six bucks. Now it's a demand curve, right? So the demand curve shows the relationship of the willingness to pay for products. Because if you go out and buy it, if you're willing to pay that, that means you were willing to give up $6 worth of other stuff that you could have bought. Willing to provide, remember, you actually only do four. But that's why the demand curve is the marginal benefit curve. So the second unit, the cost was something down here at $1.30. And so the difference between $1.30 and $4 is $2.70. And we do the same thing for each one of these units. And we get this triangular region, which is called producer surplus. <clears throat> now, producer surplus sounds like a profit, doesn't it? The difference between what I'm getting what I sold it for, and the cost of it. It turns out it's not exactly equal to profit. And I kind of want to just leave it at that because we're going to kind of, no, we're not leaving the whole class at that. <laughs> I want to leave that topic at that. So producer surplus does not equal profit, but it is close. More on this later. Later, da, 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 da. we'll talk about that concept later. So in other words, it's okay to kind of think about producer surplus being similar to a profit, but it's not, it's not really profits. Okay, so that is consumer and producer surplus. That looks like a good place to wrap up today. So we will call it there. <laughs> wow, look at I'm letting you out early again. That's like two times in a row. Thank <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>